morning. We have general questions. Question number one from Patricia Ferguson was not lodged. The member has provided an explanation. Question two, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the M8, M73, M74 motorway improvements project and its implementation. Minister Derek Mackay. February 2016 marks 24 months since construction began on this complex infrastructure project, with significant progress being made on several key routes and structures. Two-thirds of the new M8 between Bailiston and Shawhead is now complete, and work in the new underpass at Wraith Junction 5 of the M74 is well underway. Officials will continue to work closely with the construction contractor to deliver the project on time in spring 2017. Richard Lyle. Can I thank the Minister for his response and can I welcome the work that the Scottish Government are doing to improve traffic flow and management in what is a very congested area in my region. However, I would ask this, the Minister what action the Scottish Government are taking and what further action could be taken to reduce noise pollution along sections of the motorway by means of erecting fencing uh, on the M74 as a consequence of the ongoing motorway improvement plan works. Minister. I know that Mr Lyle would appreciate that these works are necessary and will be worth the wait and worth the um, inevitable uh, disruption that, that comes as a consequence. But I can advise that the project is being delivered in accordance with all the relevant regulations and legislation, including noise regulations. And prior to works commencing, the contractor agreed mitigation measures with the local authority, who has the necessary powers to ensure that these are implemented, of course. My officials will work closely with the contractor and the local authority to ensure that the noise levels are kept to a minimum using best practice techniques when practicable. But I know that this investment is well worthwhile in the motorway network to improve connections, and I'm sure that that will be welcomed by all members. Question number three, Paul Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government uh, what, its, uh, to what its response is to the document, Greater Glasgow and Clyde Paper, at service and financial planning in 2016-17 and beyond. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. As I said in response to the members' questions on the subject over the last two weeks, the Chair of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde has confirmed that this was a draft discussion paper. It was prepared for the Board's directors to help inform internal discussion on their financial position for 2016-17, but was written prior to the Scottish Government's budget being put forward in December when a substantial increase in NHS funding was announced. As the Chair, John Brown's statement of the 15th of January confirms, the draft discussion paper does not contain definite proposals or an approved plan that the Board intends to implement. None of the contents, including those relating to Lightburn Hospital, have been approved by the Board or referred to the Scottish Government for consideration. Paul Martin. President Ossa, as the Minister confirms, there is a proposal in this particular document which confirms the possibility of the closure of Lightburn Hospital. Can the Minister confirm she advised me on the 13th of January that this proposal hasn't been brought before her attention. Can she confirm that before the 13th of January there were in fact discussions with the Health Board on the issue of making the possibility of £60 million worth of savings? And this document? Cabinet Secretary. Well, in terms of the issue of Lightburn Hospital, there has been no proposal put to me and no discussions with Glasgow um, and Clyde Health Board about uh, Lightburn Hospital. In terms of the issue of the, the budgets going forward, what I've said um, to Parliament previously is that um, Scottish Government officials will be working with all boards around some of the efficiency savings that they need to make. Those efficiency savings will be reinvested in frontline services, of course. And indeed, one of the focuses of those discussions is how we can develop more shared services across not just the NHS, but across the public sector. I would have thought that the member would welcome that in order to ensure that frontline services are protected. Jackie Bailey. The Cabinet Secretary is quoted in my local press as saying she didn't know about the cuts proposed at the Vale and she wouldn't approve of them. Can she therefore tell us whether she knew about the closure of Ward 6 only in December and was she notified of this by the Health Board? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, um, Glasgow and Clyde uh, will um, inevitably bring forward changes um, to the services that are provided. What we expect, though, 
is that where there are significant changes and major changes that they consult with the local community. But as the member will know, um, boards will adjust their services all the time. It would be unreasonable for them to do otherwise. However, as Jackie Bailey quite rightly says, I have made clear to her and the local uh, community that the vision for the Vale, as developed by this government after her own government closed a &E services at the Vale and indeed, and indeed were set to close the Vale in itself. It was this government that saved the Vale of Leaving Hospital. It is this government that delivered the vision for the Vale and it is this government that will ensure that services like emergency care, for example, continue at the Vale. Jackie Bailey would be better wise to listen to that reassurance rather than to, to continue to generate fear and alarm in the local community. When I have given assurance that emergency care will continue at the Vale, I'm sure that's something that the local community will ben benefit from and will welcome. Question number four, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on Scotland's progress as a fair trade nation. Minister Hamza Yusuf. Uh, at the start of Fair Trade Fortnight 2013, I had the great pleasure of announcing that Scotland had declared, uh, been declared one of the world's first fair trade nations. Since that, significant achievements have been made. Every local authority in Scotland has active fair trade groups, with two thirds of our local authorities now awarded fair trade status. Additionally, more towns, more communities, more schools have achieved fair trade status each year, with nearly 1,200 schools part of the fair trade school scheme. And Scotland has also seen the launch of the only fair trade sports ball supplier in the UK, uh, Bala Sports. So I'm pleased to say good progress has been made since that initial announcement. Uh, my thanks to all the people, businesses, public bodies, community organisations and uh, individuals who have helped to achieve that considerable success. Claudia Beamish. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, the World Fair Trade Organisation has 10 aims for a, world uh, for a fair trade nation. And just to pick three of those at the moment, ensuring no child labour and forced labour, a commitment to non-discrimination, gender equality and women's economic empowerment, and respect for the environment. I wonder if the Minister could um, say whether uh, there's been any assessment against the aims of this organisation for Scotland as a fair trade nation, and if not, whether he would consider looking at those, those aims. Minister? I haven't seen those specific aims from that specific organisation, but everything that Claudia Beamish mentions is exactly aligning with the aims that we have for Scotland to be a fair trade nation. So I'd be happy to take that into consideration, to, to look at it. Uh, the fair trade status uh, does come with a, a very uh, heavy and robust set of criteria. Uh, and again, many of the uh, criteria that she mentioned uh, would align themselves uh, with the fair trade status that we've managed to achieve. But uh, let me have a, a look at uh, the more, de more detail of the organisation that she mentions. And as I say, I'd be happy to respond. Uh, but it certainly seems uh, eminently sensible uh, that we should have consideration uh, of those criteria. Thanks. Question number five, Alice McInnes. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on updating the Gender Recognition Act 2004 to bring it into line with international best practice as called for in the Council of Europe Resolution 2048 in 2015. Minister, Mark Scotland has a good record. In 2015, Scotland was ranked by ILGA Europe in its rainbow map as the most inclusive country in Europe for LGBTI equality, meeting 92% of ILGA's 45-point criteria. However, the Scottish Government is aware of concerns about the process of obtaining gender recognition under the 2004 Act. The Scottish Government is considering the issues raised by the Scottish Transgender Alliance's Equal Recognition Campaign very carefully. Any changes to the 2004 Act would require a full consultation, and any legislation in the Scottish Parliament to amend the 2004 Act would have to be for the next session. Alice McInnes. I am grateful to learn that the Minister is considering the representations of the Equal uh, Recognition Campaign. The Gender Recognition Act did mark a step forward at the time, but it is outmoded and in need of reform. Gender recognition should be based on declaration, 
without needing a panel of doctors and lawyers examining the evidence, and the minimum age for getting recognition should be reduced, and the legal recognition of non-binary gender should be introduced. It is within the devolved competence of this Parliament to amend the GRA to bring it into line with what the Equal Recognition Campaign is calling for. Will the Scottish Government agree to consult at least on these important matters with a view to reforming the legislation? Minister? Uh, as I have said, we are considering this, and I can uh, let uh, the member know that I have already personally met the Scottish Transgender Alliance to discuss the issue. We have also noted the UK Women in Equality uh, Committee report and discussed, uh, discussed the inquiry with my colleague, the MP for Lanark and Hamilton East, who took part in it. Now, I would not want to prejudge the outcome of any consideration in any subsequent consultation, but the record of this government is that we were the first national government in Europe to fund a transgender rights programme. We included trans and intersex in the crimes aggravated by prejudice legislation that we supported, and we have the most progressive marriage legislation on trans issues. That should give comfort that we take trans and intersex rights seriously and are always prepared where there is a strong case to act on it. Question number six, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service and what issues were discussed. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, Scottish Government officials last met with the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, including its Chief Executive, on 14 January. A number of issues relating to the court system were discussed. The Chief Executive of, of SCTS is a key member of the Justice Board and, through this forum, regularly updates uh, Scottish Government and Justice Board members on progress of courts reform and the SCTS contribution to delivery of the Justice Strategy. Claire Baker. I thank the Minister for that response. The Scottish Courts Service's 2012 consultation document that proposed the recent court closures recognised that accommodation at Kirkcaldy Sheriff Court is not fit for purpose and there was a need for a new sheriff and jury centre for the people of East Fife. Uh, £23 million has just been announced for a justice centre in Inverness with Scottish Government backing and part funding. Does the Minister agree with me that the plans for a Kirkcaldy justice centre need to be brought forward as soon as possible? Minister. <clears throat> well, the, the member is quite right that the Scottish Government will be investing £5 million uh, in 2016-17 towards the development of a new collaborative justice centre in Inverness, and that will bring together uh, justice and other bodies and provide a hub for justice technology. Uh, this will demonstrate the value of the proposed model um, and support justice throughout the Highlands, clearly, but work on site will commence this year with a view to being operational in 2018. SCTS will uh, continue <laughs> to explore all funding options for further justice centres, and this will in include further discussions with the Scottish Futures Trust on a potential solution for Fife and Lanarkshire. Question number seven, Christian Allard. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its support for the oil and gas industry. Minister, Fergus Schewing. We already provide support, in particular through our enterprise agencies and the Energy Jobs Task Force. In addition, Presiding Officer, today we have announced £379 million of Scottish Government support for the North East economy, including a 100 including a £125 million contribution to the Aberdeen City deal. I know the member and uh, others uh, will welcome this substantial investment in the region. Christian Allard. I thank the Minister for his answer and we very much appreciate it as an office. Does the Minister agree that given the UK Treasury have benefited from hundreds of billions of pounds of revenue from the North East in the good years, that they now need to take action to support the sector and must take action at the March budget to put in place a more supportive fiscal regime for the industry? Here, here. Minister. Well, yes, I do, and uh, I think it's correct to say that the industry is tackling costs and improving efficiency, but it is for the UK government to deliver no later than the spring budget the necessary tax measures that the industry need. And these are to encourage investment and exploration, to maintain and enhance investment in late life fields to prevent premature cessation of production, and to bring in new investors by clarifying decommissioning liabilities, which are blocking deals at the moment, presiding officer, unnecessarily. The UK has had in the good days over £300,000 million of tax from the oil and gas industry based in Scotland. Now it's payback time. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much, presiding officer. 
I understand the Scottish Cabinet had a special briefing on the oil jobs crisis earlier this week. Can the Minister therefore now tell us how many jobs have been lost in Scotland as a result of the downturn in the oil and gas sector? Minister? Well, the Oil and Gas UK estimate is that 65,000 jobs have been lost throughout the UK. This is an extremely serious matter, and that's precisely why we set up over a year ago the First Minister set up the Energy Jobs Task Force. It has helped young people prevent the loss of their apprenticeship by the £5,000 provision. It has reached out to around 1,500 people at direct support at three events in the Beach Ballroom and Petodrie Park. It has held innumerable events. It has had buy-in from the whole industry. Oil and gas and the industry support the Energy Jobs Task Force work. It will continue with a whole range of measures. The, the Cabinet this week did meet, and we are considering what more uh, we can do. And we are determined to do everything practical to maintain and support the industry at this difficult time. Question number eight, Graham Day. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how many staff work in the NHS and how this compares with 2006. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. Under this Government, a record high number of staff work in the NHS uh, with 137,727.9 whole time equivalent staff as at September 2015, compared to 127,061.9 whole time equivalent in September 2006. This is an increase of over 10,600 whole time equivalent, or 8.4 per cent. Graham Day. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer, but at the risk of being parochial, can I ask her how many additional staff have been recruited by NHS Tayside over that period and how that breaks down in terms of consultants, doctors, nurses, midwives, etc.? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I can tell Graeme Day that um, staffing has vastly improved over the past decade, um, enabling more staff to work in NHS Tayside. Um, NHS Tayside has seen over 7% uh, more staff, including over 200 more qualified nurses and midwives and over 150 more uh, consultants. I can say with, within those consultant numbers, there's been a particularly a big increase in emergency medi medicine consultants, up by 342%, or 17.1 whole time equivalent, from 5 to 22.1. Hopefully that is something that the member will welcome. Question number nine, Jim Eady. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to address homophobic, biphobic and transphobic bullying. Minister, Mark Biagi. The Scottish Government takes bullying very seriously. Bullying of any kind, including homophobic, biphobic and transphobic bullying, is unacceptable and must be addressed wherever it arises. We want all children and young people to be free from discrimination so that they can learn and reach their full potential. Our national approach to anti-bullying for Scotland's children and young people sets out a common vision and aims to make sure that work across all agencies and communities is jointly focused on tackling all types of bullying, including prejudice-based bullying. This guidance is currently being refreshed by a working group which includes LGBT Youth Scotland and Stonewall Scotland. I thank the, the Minister for that answer, but the Minister will be aware that in Scotland today there are still lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender young people who are afraid to go to school because of their fear of being bullied. What more can the Scottish Government do to ensure that all teachers are fully equipped to tackle bullying wherever it takes place, be it in the classroom or the playground, and to ensure that every school in the country has an appropriate policy in place to tackle this important issue? Minister? I would very much agree with the member that this is an important issue. Uh, he raises the issue of policies. We know that 28 councils have local authority-wide anti-bullying policies for schools that mention homophobic bullying. Two are developing them, and the remaining two, Stirling and Aberdeen, have been approached to work with Respect Me to do so as well. The Scottish Government's anti-bullying service, Respect Me, is funded by this Government to be the training body for anti-bullying work across the country. <laughs> 700 teachers have been trained to be trainers, and since 2007, 100%, I say again, 100% of training delivered by Respect Me has included specific work on prejudice-based bullying, including homophobic bullying. Question number 10, Duncan McNeill. Yes, Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. 
Ministers and Scottish Government officials regularly meet with representatives of all health boards, including NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Secretary, visit my, my constituency in late November. Concerns over the future of IRH were dismissed as having no substance. But a recent health board paper has revealed the hospital's repair bill has soared to a staggering £65 million, 80% of which falls within the clinical space. Given the sheer scale of the maintenance backlog, does the Health Minister now understand why my constituents are anxious about the future of the hospital? Will she now agree to, to a full public consultation so that the people of Inverclyde can have their say on the future of their local hospital? Um, <coughs> I, I, try, I caught most of what Duncan McNeill um, said there. And uh, can I first of all reassure him that uh, the, the future of the IRH is very important in terms of local health uh, service delivery. Um, the, the, in terms of the, any of the issues within the board's draft discussion paper, I, as I said earlier to Paul Martin, uh, none of those uh, issues have been formally put forward for consideration and not to me either. He mentioned back backlog maintenance, I, I think it was. Um, I will certainly write to him on the detail of that, but there has been a lot of progress made on the high-risk uh, backlog maintenance, a lot of progress made with, by prioritising that, but I will write to the member with more detail uh, on that particular issue. Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one.